In this lesson of Dirty Biochemistry in the Dirty Medicine series, we're going to be talking about fatty acid oxidation. This is also known commonly as beta oxidation. As a general overview, fatty acid oxidation, aka beta oxidation, is the process by which fatty acids are broken down into acetyl-CoA to form ketones and other metabolic fuel for various biochemical pathways. Beta oxidation actually forms the majority of energy that's available to the liver. It forms ketone bodies in the liver, which are available to brain and muscle. The size of the fatty acid that you're breaking down determines where it is oxidized. And you're going to see that on the next few slides because this is actually a very high yield discussion. So the size of the fatty acid basically determines where it's broken down and where that beta oxidation occurs. And the reason that this is high yield and the reason that test writers and exam writers go after this concept is because it's just some minutia that you have to memorize. And unfortunately, that's the theme when it comes to biochemistry on USMLE and Comlex. So the way that you should mentally triage this in your brain is to use a chart. And, and I love charts because it simplifies concepts. So the three different fatty acid sizes that you should be familiar with mentally are short and medium chain fatty acids, long chain fatty acids, and very long chain fatty acids. I kind of find it hilarious that they named long chain fatty acids and very long chain fatty acids, um, <laughs> those names, because they're, they're literally very long chain fatty acids is what they call uh, the biggest group. But anyway, the short and medium chain fatty acids have two to 12 carbons. The long chain fatty acids have between 14 and 20 carbons. And the very long chain fatty acids have greater than 20 carbons, so 21 or more. So how do you remember this? I know this, I said this is high yield. It's definitely important to know. You've got to have a way to remember which carbon number corresponds to which category because you're going to get a question on this. So the way that I do this is I compare the number of carbons to your age in school. And then I, based, based on that age, I say, do you only have to study for a short or medium amount of time? Do you have to study for a long amount of time? Or do you have to study for a very long amount of time? And this will make sense in just a second. So this is uh, the dirty medicine mnemonic. So if we look at the first one, short and medium chain fatty acids have between 2 and 12 carbons. So I say that when you are between 2 and 12 years of age, you're in elementary school. And anyone who's in elementary school really only needs to study for a short or medium amount of time. It's really not that difficult. It's elementary school. It's, you know, how hard is it really? What's six plus six, you know? So the way that I go through fatty acids, again, is to figure out which category they go into. I do what age you are in school and how long you have to study. So two to 12, you're in elementary school. You only study for a short or medium amount of time. In, when you're 14 to 20, you're in high school slash college, and this is where you actually have to start studying for a long amount of time. So, you know, think about undergraduate school when you were studying organic chemistry and uh, biology 101. You, you probably did have to study for a long amount of time to do well and get to medical school where you are now. Very long chain is uh, greater than 20. So when you're greater than 20 years old, this is the time in your life where you're actually in medical school. And when you're in medical school, as you very well know, you have to study for a very long amount of time. So again, this was the stupid mnemonic that I came up with because there's really no other way to, to memorize this. It sort of sucks to have to memorize 2 to 12 short medium, 14 to 20 long, greater than 20 very long. So I do this in terms of years and then how long you'd have to be studying at that time to do well in school. So again, that's my way of memorizing this, but let's come back to the chart because the chart always simplifies everything. Now, in addition to knowing the short medium and how many carbons there are, long and how many carbons there are, very long and how many carbons there are, you need to know where beta oxidation is occurring. This is another very high yield topic. So not only can they go after how many carbons there are in the chain, but they can ask you where beta oxidation or fatty acid oxidation or fatty acid breakdown will actually occur. So in the short and medium chain fatty acids, these will diffuse freely into the mitochondria and then in the mitochondria, uh, beta oxidation will occur there. In the long chain fatty acids, you have to use what's called a carnitine transport to get into the mitochondria for beta oxidation to occur. And this is the highest yield of the three and what we're gonna spend the bulk of this video talking about. 
because that carnitine transport system is, is very complex, and that is where the majority of your biochemistry questions will come from when they're testing you on beta oxidation. And then just for completeness sake, the very long chain uh, fatty acids, the ones that have more than 20 carbons, those actually have to be oxidized inside of a peroxisome because they're just way too big to do anywhere else. So you really need the heavy duty peroxisomal process to oxidize those fatty acids. Now I told you that that long chain group, the 14 to 20 carbons is the highest yield of the three. And that's where we're gonna spend the majority of today's video. And we're gonna start by talking about what exactly is a carnitine transport system. Because before you can really get to beta oxidation itself, there's this slew of biochemistry that comes first, and that is referred to as carnitine transport. So carnitine transport is really the precursor to beta oxidation, and it's going to be the precursor of what all of your questions will probably be if they're going to ask you questions about beta oxidation, because this in and of itself is its own little biochemistry pathway that precedes the ability to do beta oxidation of long chain fatty acids. So in our discussion of carnitine transport, we have to start with a little background, a little diagram here. So the top of the slide is the cytoplasm. Between the two dotted lines is the mitochondrial membrane. And then that bottom line and down is the mitochondria. So you start with your fatty acid, right? In the previous lesson, we talked about fatty acid synthesis. And at this point, you've got fatty acids in the body ready to be mobilized and converted into fuel. So you've got your fatty acid. And that fatty acid gets converted into a fatty acyl-CoA by the enzyme fatty acyl-CoA synthetase. Look at the name of the enzyme. If you're tired of hearing me say this, it's gonna happen much more throughout uh, this course, so get used to it. Fatty acyl-CoA synthetase. You are synthetasing or synthesizing fatty acyl-CoA. So the name of the enzyme always tells you what either your reactants are or what your product's going to be. Now, fatty acyl-CoA can go into the mitochondrial membrane. And this is a high yield point because fatty acids cannot. So in order to get it into the mitochondria, first you have to put it into the mitochondrial membrane. So fatty acyl-CoA will diffuse into the mitochondrial membrane. And it's here that the key conversion occurs in the carnitine transport system. So fatty acyl-CoA gets converted to fatty acyl-carnitine by carnitine acyl transferase 1. This enzyme is also known as CAT, C-A-T-1. So CAT1 is the same thing as carnitine acyl transferase 1. Now, in this step, all you're doing is substituting the CoA for the carnitine. Because once that carnitine is on the fatty acyl group, it could proceed down the pathway. So far, just to quickly summarize where we are, we started with fatty acids and the body wants to break them down to use them for energy. And this is a long chain fatty acid. Again, we're talking about the carnitine transport system because for long chain fatty acids, they have to go through carnitine transport to get into the mitochondria. So the fatty acid gets a CoA slapped on it and it becomes fatty acyl CoA. Fatty acyl CoA enters the mitochondrial membrane and then substitutes that CoA for a carnitine group by the enzyme carnitine acyl transferase 1. Now the first really high yield point that I need to bring up is that this step is inhibited by melanyl-CoA. Now remember from the video on fatty acid synthesis that melanyl-CoA is one of the downstream products in that pathway. So obviously if you have melanyl-CoA floating around, it means that you're doing fatty acid synthesis because it's formed in that pathway and ultimately will be converted into palmitate, which is the end product of fatty acid synthesis. So this is just a feedback mechanism because if you have melanyl-CoA and therefore you're making palmitate and therefore you're synthesizing fatty acids, why in the hell would you wanna break them down? So if there's melanyl-CoA present, it will inhibit this step and prevent the oxidation, AKA the breakdown, of fatty acids. So I think that that makes perfect sense, but in, able, you know, in order for you to be able to recall that and make sense of that, you need to have first watched the video on fatty acid synthesis. So refer back to that video if you need more clarification. But just to summarize once more, because this is a very high yield point, melanyl-CoA is formed in fatty acid synthesis. So therefore, melanyl-CoA will inhibit beta oxidation, which is just the opposite, where you break down the fatty acids. So melanyl-CoA will specifically inhibit this step where CAT1, aka carnitine acyl transferase 1, takes place.
Now, after this step, fatty acylcarnitine will go into the mitochondria. And once it's in the mitochondria, it can be converted into fatty acyl-CoA, and the carnitine group kind of just splits off and is present as a product. Now, as you can see, the whole goal of this carnitine transport system was to get the fatty acyl-CoA into the mitochondria. But the only way to do that was to slap carnitine on it and put it through a carnitine transporter. So that is the goal of the carnitine shuttle system or the carnitine transport system. And the enzyme that converts fatty acyl carnitine to fatty acyl CoA plus carnitine, when you rip the carnitine off and put the CoA back on, is carnitine acyl transferase 2, aka CAT2. So don't get confused, there's CAT1 and CAT2. CAT1 is the enzyme in the mitochondrial membrane that puts the carnitine in place of the CoA, and then carnitine acyl transferase 2, or CAT2, is the enzyme in the mitochondria that puts the CoA back on the fatty acyl in place of the carnitine. So they're really having opposite effects. Very, very high yield to understand that difference. Now everything you see on this slide is all referred to as part of the carnitine transport system, sometimes called the carnitine shuttle. This is technically not beta oxidation, right? Fatty acid oxidation is what comes after this once you've gotten the fatty acyl CoA into the mitochondria. So everything you see here, I'm going to put in a little gray box and summarize it and kind of shrink it down a little bit. This is what we've just talked about. The fatty acid went into the membrane, went through CAT1, came into the mitochondria, went through CAT2, and now you've got a fatty acyl CoA which was transported through the carnitine shuttle and is now finally ready for the meat and potatoes of fatty acid oxidation. So the first step of fatty acid oxidation is to take that fatty acyl-CoA and convert it to acetyl-CoA. The enzyme that does this is fatty acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. Again, look at the name of the enzyme. It's dehydrogenating fatty acyl-CoA. So you know by memorizing the name of the enzyme, you also know the reactant. It's fatty acyl-CoA. And your product is acetyl-CoA. Now, something that's very high yield to understand about this enzyme is that the name fatty acyl-CoA dehydrogenase is how you'll see it written on exams, but you may see it as either medium chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase or long chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase. So basically, depending on the number of carbons in the fatty acid, the name of the enzyme changes because the enzyme medium chain blah 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 breaks down medium chain fatty acyl CoA, and the enzyme long chain acyl blah 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 breaks down long chain fatty acyl CoA. So the only thing that changes in the enzyme name is based on which reactant you have. Is it a medium chain? Is it a long chain? Et cetera, et cetera. Now, once you have acetyl-CoA, it can be converted into two products. One is ketone bodies that occurs in the liver, and the other is it can actually go back into the TCA cycle. Because if you recall from the TCA cycle, acetyl-CoA is what's formed from pyruvate and enters the TCA cycle. So the whole goal of fatty acid breakdown or beta oxidation is to provide fuel for the body. And when you get to acetyl-CoA, you're at the end step. And now the biochemistry has two choices. One is it can do ketone body synthesis in the liver, shown there in orange. Now that is its own pathway that we're gonna talk about in the next lesson. But when you form ketone bodies, it's a primary source of fuel when the body is in a period of starvation. And the other option is to have that acetyl-CoA simply go back and feed the TCA cycle to generate ATP for the electron transport chain and to generate the other factors that you need for the electron transport chain, which we've already discussed in a prior video. So this is a key step, and I'm going to summarize one more time because it's very important you understand the big picture. We've gone through the carnitine shuttle to get fatty acyl-CoA ready for beta oxidation. Beta oxidation takes place and converts fatty acyl-CoA into acetyl-CoA through fatty acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, which you may see written as medium or long chain fatty acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, depending on how long the fatty acyl is. You form acetyl-CoA, which has two options. One, if the body needs to form ketones in a period of starvation or to fuel the brain, etc., it'll go through ketone body synthesis, which is a pathway that we'll discuss in the next lesson. The other option, if it wants to generate ATP for the body through the electron transport chain, is to shunt the acetyl-CoA into the TCA cycle to generate all of the factors that you need, such as your FADs and your NADs, etc., to go into the electron transport chain and generate massive amounts of ATP. 
refer to the electron transport chain lesson, which was earlier in the Dirty Biochemistry series, for more information about how that works. That is the overview of the carnitine shuttle system plus beta oxidation. And it's not that many steps, so you already know everything that you need to know about the actual pathway. The other things that we need to talk about, which are extremely high yield, are things like the rate limiting enzyme, what negatively impacts this pathway, and a couple diseases that take place when certain enzymes are deficient or knocked out. So first, let's talk about the rate limiting enzyme of fatty acid oxidation or beta oxidation. So CAT1 is the rate limiting enzyme. And I want to pause for a second. I know that I told you that everything in the gray box is technically the carnitine transport system or the carnitine shuttle and not truly beta oxidation. But if you put that together with the steps outside of the gray box, people still refer to everything you see on this slide as beta oxidation. And therefore the rate limiting enzyme of beta oxidation is CAT1. So you absolutely need to memorize that. How do you remember this? Well, I've got a mnemonic for you. Now, the enzyme name, that's the rate limiting enzyme, is CAT1, also known as carnitine acyl transferase 1. And there are two ways that I used to remember this. One is that you can remember that carnitine acyl transferase 1 is the rate limiting enzyme that is responsible for the carnage of fatty acids or the destruction of fatty acids. Fatty acid breakdown, the carnage of fatty acids. Carn in carnage, carn in carnitine acyl transferase 1. The other way that you can remember this is to just memorize the enzyme and know that it's CAT1. And when I think of a cat, I think of a cat that's eating a lot of fatty acids that are being broken down in tuna because cats just, for whatever reason, love tuna. So CAT1, CAT, CAT, fatty acids being broken down in tuna. I know these are rather stupid, but they're going to give you free points on test day. So don't, don't hate on these mnemonics. Now, the thing that is going to inhibit this pathway, inhibit beta oxidation, is melanol-CoA. And we already talked about exactly where that takes place. And just to refresh your memory, remember this slide. Melanol-CoA inhibited CAT1 and inhibited the conversion of fatty acyl-CoA to fatty acyl-carnitine. Again, just to really hammer home this extremely high yield point, melanol-CoA is formed in fatty acid synthesis. So if you're doing fatty acid synthesis, melanol-CoA is going to inhibit fatty acid breakdown. It just makes perfect sense. So please understand this because it's an extremely high yield point. The next thing that we need to talk about, which is probably the highest yield point that we'll talk about in this entire video, are the diseases that can manifest when you have certain problems with your enzymes. And to have that discussion, we're gonna use this slide, but I wanna clean this up so that you only focus on the diseases. So I'm gonna erase all of the crap here and just leave our two enzymes, CAT1 and CAT2. The first disease, is what's known as systemic primary carnitine deficiency. And this occurs when you can't get the fatty acyl-CoA into the mitochondrial membrane. So you have a problem with exactly where that brown X is shown. In this disease, what you're gonna have is obviously no transport into the mitochondrial membrane, but the symptoms that you'll get are hypoketotic hypoglycemia. Now look at the words, hypoketotic, so few ketones, hypoglycemia, few glucose or low glucose. So low ketones, low glucose. Think about it. If you can't get fatty acyl-CoA into the mitochondrial membrane, then you can never do all of the steps after it. So you never get to beta oxidation. You never form acetyl-CoA and you never have the option to do ketone body synthesis. So it's no surprise that the first thing you'll see are low ketones. The other thing that you'll see is low glucose, because if you can never mobilize energy stores, then you can't break down fat to help provide more energy and to provide more glucose. Okay, so I want you to memorize hypoketotic hypoglycemia and the problem in systemic primary carnitine deficiency is that you can't transport your fatty acyl-CoA into the mitochondrial membrane. The next disease that we're gonna talk about is what's known as myopathic CAT2 deficiency. And the name of the disease tells you exactly what the problem is. The problem is that CAT2 is either deficient or knocked out. In this disease, what you'll see is myoglobinuria, hypotonic and weak muscles, and an increase, an increase of triglycerides in the muscle. So you'll see things like rhabdomyolysis and all of the sequelae of having muscle breakdown because the triglycerides are accumulating in the muscle. Now look at what's happening here. 
If CAT2 gets knocked out and you can't break down fatty acylcarnitine, then you have an accumulation of these carnitine products or these carnitine bound fatty acyls in the muscle. And because of that, you're having an abnormal accumulation of triglyceride type products in the muscle. So the muscle breaks down. And anytime that muscle breaks down, you get classic symptoms. So you get myoglobinuria, so muscle breakdown products entering the urine. That's very damaging to the kidney, so you'll see an increased creatinine in your labs. The urine will look dark. So if someone urinates and ha they have myoglobin in it, it'll look very dark. And because muscle is breaking down, you have an elevation in your CK enzyme. So if they give you lab printouts and they have a vignette about beta oxidation with the deficiency of CAT2, look for the labs of an increased creatinine since the kidney is damaged because the myoglobin is passing through the kidney. Look for dark urine. Look for signs and symptoms of rhabdomyolysis, so weak muscles, painful muscles, tender muscles, hypotonic because there's too much abnormal triglyceride in the muscles, so the muscles don't work correctly. And look for an elevated CK because muscle breakdown raises the enzyme CK, which you classically see in rhabdomyolysis. So this is myopathic CAT2 deficiency. The third disease that we need to talk about, we'll do so on this slide. And just to summarize what we've already talked about, again, everything that we've talked about on the previous slide is still shown here in the gray box. So the brown knockout and the, the orange knockout. But our third and final disease, which is very, very high yield, is when you have a problem with fatty acyl CoA dehydrogenase. So when you have a problem with the enzyme that converts the fatty acyl CoA into acetyl CoA. So if you knock that out, you get what's called medium chain fatty acyl CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. So specifically, this is a deficiency where the enzyme that breaks down the medium chain fatty acyls doesn't work. And in this, what you'll see is non-ketotic hypoglycemia, hepatic dysfunction, leading to hyperammonemia, and then we'll talk about the treatment in just a second. But let's look at what's happening here. So in this case, you can't get the fatty acyls converted into acetyl-CoA. So you can never make your ketone bodies. You can't send acetyl-CoA back into the TCA cycle. So what's going to happen here is that you're going to get non-ketotic hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia because you can't mobilize your energy stores and non-ketotic because you absolutely cannot form the ketone bodies. This will lead to an abnormal accumulation of products in the liver and lead to hepatic dysfunction because the majority of ketone body synthesis occurs in the liver. So if you knock this out, then you're disrupting a normal physiologic process that's occurring in the liver. So you'll get liver dysfunction, also known as hepatic dysfunction, which could in very rare cases progress to hepatic failure. And when you have hepatic dysfunction and hepatic failure, you get hyperammonemia. So signs and symptoms of too much ammonia in the body. So look for things like asterixis, et cetera. And the treatment here is going to be to avoid fasting. So we'll talk about this more in the ketone body synthesis lesson, which will be after this video. But whenever you're in a period of starvation, that is when ketone bodies are going to be formed. But if you have this disease and you can't form ketone bodies, then you can't put the body into a fasting state because in a fasting state, the body relies on ketone synthesis to provide fuel to the body and to provide fuel to the brain. So if you have this disease and there's absolutely no way of making ketones, but you're in a period of starvation where you're relying on ketones, then that's gonna be really, really bad. So the treatment here is to avoid fasting and constantly eat carbohydrates because if you eat carbohydrates, you'll never be in a period where your body needs to form ketones instead. So just to summarize the three diseases, I put them in this chart. Again, systemic primary carnitine deficiency, problem uh, that leads to hypoketotic hypoglycemia, myopathic CAT2 deficiency, look for things like rhabdomyolysis and myoglobinuria, dark urine, elevated CK, some kidney damage, so increased creatinine, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, medium chain fatty acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency leading to non-ketotic hypoglycemia and remember to avoid fasting because there's no way to make ketones. So if you fast and can't make ketones, you could really have significant problems, especially when you can't feed the brain the ketones that it needs. So that's the end of this lesson. That was everything that you needed to know about fatty acid breakdown, also known as fatty acid oxidation, also known as beta oxidation. Remember that fatty acid oxidation has two parts to it. The first part is the carnitine shuttle or the carnitine transport system. And the second part is the actual beta oxidation itself, 
which is a very short part of the pathway. But when you combine these two, that is what together is referred to as fatty acid oxidation. I hope that this was enjoyable for you and that you learned a lot. We're going to continue our next discussion in the next lesson with ketone body synthesis.